it can't have a protracted character, or on the other hand, it may not be. Now, one of the reasons why they say that is, well, look at the Philippine murders with the dates of 1946 and 1954, and the general back there pointed out we had the Malayan campaign was at eight or ten years also in Malaya, but really they finally figured out what to do in the last couple of years. They, they went pretty good. It was because the dummies in the beginning couldn't figure out what the hell to do. Max Hase came on board. He said, "Hey, I got the picture. You know, he cleaned it up real fast." And they were they were on the verge of defeat too. Of course, it's not so cleaned up right now. It's sort of a temporary respite because now they're back in trouble again. I mean, you know, two years, a career of conflict for two years, that could be a protracted war for us, based on how it's public. <laughs> you uh, trumped me. I said you trumped me. And then, but I, I agree with you. Okay. When I say you trumped me, in a sense, you're right. In other words, our public two year war, that's not you know, that's too long. So, how is how our how are military? Different? But see, but that's whose fault is that? You made a good point there. Whose fault is that if they think it's too long? Whose fault is that? Goddamn right, it's our fault. Whether we're in the uniform or other parts of government, to make sure that people understand that this is you can't do it any other way. So the fact that we let them have that perception, it's the government's fault. You know, if they look in the mirror, he's the son of a bitch. Government guy looking in the mirror, he's look, there's the son of a bitch that did it, and he's the one. That's me. See, because I think you could put out a compelling message on that. Of course, you got to know what the message is, how to handle it, and all that kind of stuff. If you don't know what you're doing, you can't put out the message. What's the message? Well, what's at stake in this whole thing? And the fact you just can't run a goddamn, you know, a thousand uh, tank uh, operation through some jungle somewhere, a quick uh, operation, or leave the perception in your mind it's going to strictly be, you know, a high intensity uh, conflict when you head over in Europe, we're going to win the goddamn thing. I guess you know, my question is more, scenario. I understand that, yeah. but getting the American people, I mean, just, I, I think we're still singeing from uh, Vietnam and anything that's more than uh, a weekend long like Lebanon when you're in and out before the press can say Why? Peace. Why? Just because of we haven't got the message out, of it. I blame it on ourselves. Well, I say this is you got to blame it on yourself. If you don't do anything, what? If you don't blame it on yourself, you're not going to change. It's important you blame it on yourself because you say, "God damn, we're dummies. Let's get the damn thing straightened out." It forces you to do things that you wouldn't otherwise do and come to grips with the problem. I think, I think I'm See, I'm what you're doing is you're making yourself come to grips with the problem. I That's think what I'm going to say. It's not just that we have not gotten the message out. That thinking that you just described, that we could take a bunch of tanks down there and uh, roll them through Nicaragua or wherever, uh, uh, and drop a lot of bombs, and then when the war, I, I find that mentality still exists right. within the military at very senior levels, That's right. at very That's senior right. levels. So not only have we not gotten the message out, but we haven't learned how to do it. Not only haven't you gotten the message out, you haven't even got it in within the service. Not only out, but not even in. Well, you could win the war in Nicaragua in a couple of weeks with a bunch of tanks to show them that. That's not what the problem is. The problem is, once it involves the national rhetoric, it sound good. Yeah, yeah, Nicaragua that's the wrong. That's Nicaragua is the wrong example. Yeah. So, right. so the point is that what we really need to explain to people after we've learned it ourselves so we're talking 10, 20 years. We started dealing deal with the Salvadorans, sir. We wanted to hear a three-year war. They said 10. Well, now we've been committed since 80, basically, and it's almost 10. And Duarte gets on TV three months ago and says, well, 35, 40. That's, you know, really, it's, it's a permanent commitment. And we haven't convinced ourselves that. But if we ever do that... But if you have a permanent commitment, commitment you also got to know how you're committing yourself. And because we didn't know how to commit ourselves, and our leaders in many areas, maybe some of them were were, uh, were malicious, but many of them weren't. In a sense, they were lying to the American people. Sometimes they didn't even know they were lying. And the guys looked at it, and they got madder than hell. There were two factions, essentially. That's one right. that wanted to put U.S. guys on the ground, and one that wanted to do what we're doing, <laughs> short of this country, within, within, you know, the limited context of their capabilities. They, they still think that hell have to big time in the answer. But the point is that I don't think you'll ever sell if you're, you know, the politics thing with they are, you'll never sell the American public a 40 or 50 year commitment at X, number, X millions of dollars. Depends on the level. That, 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 that they don't understand. It depends on the level of how you approach it. What does that right. commitment entail? If it means putting in some advisors, as we did in Vietnam initially, they might buy off on that if you really get them with the, the rationale for it. But it's much more than that. Convince it's, them it's, putting, it's, it's equipping them, it's arming them, and it's, it's $70, $100 million a year. And I can observe Well, what was well, what was the initial, what was the initial uh, cost of Vietnam putting in the, uh, the caps? What did that cost? 
I don't know. No, well, well, when, when, when I'm saying I'm is, really you're not going to put U.S. guys on the ground. You can advise them. A place like South I mean, or, or <laughs> the West, you have to equip them. You have to continue to arm them and supply them. That costs a lot of money. Well, if we're not willing to do that, we'll lose it. Why don't the military can sell that message. Go. I think we're going to do a priest. Let's, Let's kick off and get back to that. I'll, I'll get back to that. I got some things that he, you mentioned. I'll get back to that. Let's get back to that. Okay, we're up to the synthesis now. What, basically, what I want to do is we look at all these various wars and conflicts and the various ways we approach it tactically, strategically, grand tactically, and all that. And we pull these apart and put them back together. Now, what I want to do is go into super synthesis. In other words, we're going to take advantage of all that information we've been gathered. And we're going to start stuffing it together in terms of a sort of a conceptual way we look at this thing. And remember in the beginning, I made a promise to you. I said, not only are we going to look at categories of conflict, we're going to look at tactics, strategies, and grand strategies. And that's what we're going to get at right here in the synthesis. Okay. So first of all, one of the things I said we wanted to look at was pattern, for, uh, pattern, uh, pattern of operation, pattern of successful operation. First of all, you got to have some kind of goal. You know, where the hell are you going? Then you got to have some kind of a plan to feed that goal, and some kind of action to feed the plan, support, and a command structure to glue the whole thing together. Without that, you don't glue it together, nothing's going to happen. So you, you kind of think of it that way. You don't mean to. So knowing that, and thinking about what we've been through here, some words you can put to it, very general sense to go. What you're really, in a sense, what you're trying to do is you're trying to diminish your adversary's freedom by cutting his ability down to do the kind of things he wants to do. At the same time, improve your ability or improve your freedom of action. As a result, you can shape and cope with his efforts as they unfold. He will be unable to stay up with it. That's sort of your goal. You want to lay that on him in a very general sense. I don't want to make this specific. Now, we're not talking about going to Nicaragua or Chile or wherever you're going, or even in our own country. We're just saying we want a general idea. What are we really trying to achieve here? Very general sense. Remember, I want to keep it very general. Okay, knowing that, we say, let's look at our plan. Straight Sun Tzu. You've got to know your enemy. You know, remember, he said, know your enemy, know yourself. Strength, weakness, maneuvers, and intention. Remember what I said, Homer said, and what uh, he repented. We never knew our enemy. You've got to reach inside his system. <clears throat> you know, if you don't reach inside, how are you going to exploit weakness? It's kind of tough. Or expose vulnerabilities. Play the weaknesses vis a vis the vulnerabilities. It's going to get very tough. And then apply a variety of measures. Menace, uncertainty, mistrust. We're quite moral as well with ambiguity, deception, and novelty. That way you have a base for not only breaking down his ties, but also disorienting your twisting his mental images. So he can't even cope with the world with that environment you're exposing him to. Therefore, in a sense, we magnify our present activity. In other words, Christ said, see, we think we're everywhere, but nowhere, you know, like the Mongols. And like with little heartless. And then you want to select initiative or response as least expected. Some people say unexpected. Well, unexpected is best, but at least least expected, so it can't cope with it. And not only in a physical sense, we're talking about moral mental sense as well. Remember, we're always keeping the moral, mental, and physical in mind. And then you want to set up your focus of main effort, or if you want to call it your focus of effort, together with your other related effort, and pursue those directions. You know what I'm saying here? Permit many happenings. Because you only have one thing, and that gets blocked, the game's over. You want to have many things because what you're doing, you're trying to put him in a position where he can't keep up with the activity. He can't discern what's going on. Also, many branches. It doesn't mean you're going to pursue them all, but what you're doing, you're giving yourself the opportunity to lever him on your turn. Keep the initiative. And threaten alternative objectives, which remember I said a little harder to write that out. In other words, have more than one objective, so you can shift gears and always keep him rolling again under your punch. Okay, and then move along those paths. In fact, what you do by doing that, you're really setting up the paths of least resistance. By setting it up, they begin to reveal themselves, so now you can roll through those paths of least resistance, morally, mentally, and physically. Either reinforce or exploit successes. And then here's an important one. You know what we want to do? We want to exploit rather than disrupt or destroy with differences, frictions, obsessions, etc. And interfere with his ability to cope with unfolding circumstances. Let me give you an example there. The gorillas look very nicely, and this is what I mean by this. Let's say. There's a grill operation going on, as an example, and there's a corrupt province chief in there. Well, normally the people that are tend to try to go through the grillas, you got them to take out that corrupt province chief. The grillas say, bullshit. No, no, don't take out the corrupt province chief. I'm going to say, these guys are tough. Instead of taking out the corrupt province chief, by having him there, he becomes a recruiting poster for the people who come over to their, hits their side. So they resist that until they get the whole thing, and then they, then they take his head off. Because he's a recruiting poster. By, if they put a good guy in here, then it's going to make their job tougher. You see what I'm getting at? And this way you've got to think through this stuff. Now, if they make too big a fuss, 
then they're going to have to take them out. But they sort of would like to use them as long as they can as a recruiting post. This is a very subtle, very insidious team. Okay, and then subverted, so I'm just using that as one example. And then these kinds of subverted, disoriented, the, the idea is go after those critical connections. In other words, find out to generate those many non cooperative centers of gravity we're talking about here. So you can break down their cohesion and you mop them up. Sort of a mop up is the case in the video. That's what you're trying to do. So these are the kind of things you sort of want to you know, memorize. These are the sort of things you just kind of get part of your thing, sort of in the back of your head. Don't get them too present, because pretty soon you can't think. You're only worrying about building squares. They're just sort of back there. <clears throat> and then your action. Observe going to be more conspicuous, do it quicker, be more direct. Remember what I told you about Germany, about the Cossack cavalry. I had a big discussion between the Cossack cavalry and these other cavalry, the French cavalry. And he's talking about, boy, the irregularity was hard to figure out what they're doing and all that, and they, but yet they seem to do things so common purpose. And he said he made the remark that, oh, Lloyd, the guy that preceded him, he said he recognized that was the Cossack cavalry was better than the other cavalry because of that. But then as he looked at the evidence, he said, well, in a sense, Lloyd was right, but we all know the regular cavalry is better. So he voted, he, he voted against himself, even after he looked at his evidence. But we don't do that today. We don't vote against ourselves, even after we see the evidence. Only Germany does that. And that's why I'm trying to tell you, God, you, when you, you see it, don't fight it. You say, God, is it true? Do I have other evidence that true? And you say, it's true. And so therefore, you're going to have to get over your preconceptions and say, God damn, we're going to have to face that. And Germany didn't face it. This is a good example. I showed Mike, you go get the book, it's right in the Mike. It's very clear. You read it, you say, I can't believe this. Clear as a bell. He voted wrong. Enough. And just like I told you, the Civil War. You look at that book, Attack and Die, I don't know how many people read it, and Forward in the Battle, which one in the Civil War. I mean, not, yeah, the Attack and Die of the Civil War. Forward in the Battle covered a lot of those wars in the 19th century. And where these formations would break down because they broke down and said the attack would succeed. <coughs> And so they thought they, they just blundered into a victory. They didn't realize that the formation, these regular formations, were, were making them unable to succeed. Once again, voted the wrong way. And they, the writing's right there. I looked at it. I said, my God, here it is. And they couldn't see their own evidence because they had their, their biases fixed by all those drill regulations they've been looking at for 20, 30, 40, and 50 years. We all know that they're good drill regulations. And that's why you've got to always try to one thing I have bring up, you always try to unravel your own ideas. When you look at it, say, try to keep unraveling your own preconceptions. Make that a, an honest process within yourself. I mean, you're not doing it to have chaos. You're just doing it to be sure you don't have biases that are not allowing you to face the situation. So these are the kind of things. The basic idea by doing this, look at this, more, more quickly, more in a regular person. The other guy says, what the hell's going on here? See, that allows you to be excited. So therefore, you can shape your main effort to do all of it. You can unexpectedly penetrate vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Exposed by that effort or the other efforts you've got going on, it tends to free thing up. In other words, sort of like a Chen Chi idea. We we'll talk about. Okay, and your support, your communication, and just the other one is to maintain cohesion overall effort. The other one is to so you can operate at an appropriate pace of operations. Let me show you how that. And then finally, your command. Look, I call this command of the lifetime. Decentralized and tactical. In other words, you want those guys to be tigers, give freedom of action within a common outlook, a common frame of reference. And then by doing that, as they see those opportunities open up, they go through. They straight through. I call this command of the light touch. Remember, the more you try to control somebody, the way we've been talking about before, the less control you really have. You want to exert control through your value system, through your common ideas, common outlook. That's your control measure. Not say, do this exactly this way, because you lose your control when you do that. And I can't overemphasize that. And then centralize the strategic sense, because that's the overall view. Where you're worrying about, you know, established names, matching ambitions and means and talents, sketching flexible plans, allocating resources, and shaping the overall focus of that. <laughs> Even Patton understood that. He told his colonels, get the hell out of the tactics. You're only going to muck up the operation. <clears throat> you probably saw that. Remember, it's not I found it. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not quoting, but I'm paraphrasing. Oh, it's very hard. I quoted that in uh, yeah. the Confederate. You're going to screw up your goddamn yeah. operations. Get the hell out of the tactics. That's not, not your job. I told his colonels that. Now stay the hell out of it. So he understood it. Okay? Knowing that, now what I want to do is I want to look at the, I want to sort of focus on this plan and action. Let's play. I want to play with that a little bit. You see what I'm saying? So let's play with that. You'll see why in a minute. 
So the impressions I'm trying to create there with those plan and action things. One, we're trying to penetrate adversary system and mask ours against his penetration. So we can't get in that inside our system. Two, we want to create a variety of impressions of what is occurring or about to occur. In other words, once again, it makes it difficult makes it difficult for him to keep track of what's going on. And because of that, you want to generate mismatch of what seems to be and what is. In other words, he's got an image or images of the world that really don't correspond to what's going on. Got it? And finally, you want to push him beyond his ability to adapt. So he can't even keep up or keep pace with what's going on. And I call this, for lack of a better word, first of all, we'll just call it a first impression. The first goal is the substate. The second, remember the intentions that make up the plan cannot happen without an application of transit that make up the action. You have a good plan, but you have no initiative to execute that. It's belonging. No good. So you got to execute. Okay, and I call this the second impression. Now let's work at, look at the first goal. The first impression. And I go back to Napoleon. Some comments made by Napoleon. And what I'm showing you here, his comments really fit in very nice with our plan and action statements. Fit in nice. I mean, his, yeah. His strategic intent, you know, the plan you're sort of thinking strategically, the, the action you're thinking tactically, you see what I'm saying? And in that sense, they fit in nicely with the following comments by Napoleon. Let's read it. Anybody, what does that, what do those two paragraphs tell you, those two passages, what do those two passages really tell you? What's Napoleon tell you? What's he, just give it to me, very condensed, what he's saying here, I want it very condensed, very succinct. For the war, because there. That's right. Which means what then? What do you want to do? Knowing that all, what he's saying, all human beings, even the genius that he was, Napoleon and the commanders, this is a big problem. And it's something they have to resolve, right? I mean, that's what he's saying. I mean, you know, I don't care whether you like his language or not, but basically that's what he's telling. You might say, well, I wish he would have said it. Well, that's not the argument. I don't care what he said. There. But that's the message. And you think about it, so that's really a true message. That's really true. What is he really saying? If that's the case, that's a vulnerability that all human beings have. What you want to do is feed that vulnerability. That's a weakness of vulnerability. You want to turn the argument around and say, oh, is that the problem? We're going to make it even tougher than he'll never be able to. <clears throat> you feel ever present bone by his weakness. So if we turn these arguments around, you want to play to that. You want to lever that. Because it's a natural human condition. You want to lever that natural human condition if you're in a conflict situation. Okay? So we're going to do that. So putting together the stuff we've been talking about here, when you want to think about grand tactics or operational level, whatever you want to call it, or like you Marines like to call it campaigning, which is all right too. I just use the old fashioned term. And, uh, and know what I'm saying here. This then sets up this, which sets up this. You know what I'm saying? Get inside by doing these kinds of things. Create a tangle through here, not here. Generate mismatches between those things you observe and those kind of things you have to react or adapt to. Now, if you can start doing that kind of stuff, thereby, that allows you to mesh him in a marvelous, menacing, unpredictable world of all these kinds. As a matter of fact, not only that, you literally fold him back inside himself because now he's out of touch with his environment. And what happens when that happens? Doubt, uncertainty, panic, chaos, unglue. And see, thereby, that sets up your maneuver, adversary beyond his capacity to adapt and endure, so he can either divine our intention or focus our efforts to deal with You just pull him apart, bit by bit, more than bit by bit, chunk by chunk, bit by bit. So that's the sort of a philosophy you want to have, okay? With that in mind, then, let's go to the second impression. Where I said the transients, you have to have the transients to feed the uh, intentions to make up the plan. So remember, I don't care whether you write it this way, but you want to get inside his tempo or pace, or get inside his little loops, whatever you want to call it, get inside his mind time space. That, by doing that, that permits you to realize these intentions. And these are nothing more than replay the statements I had under what? The plan and the pattern of successful operations. But know what I underline. Note these underlines. The reason why I underline those, those underlines actually, if you look at those words, it's implicit in all those statements. 
things that are underlined are implicit in every statement. There. And by doing this, all this, you can realize the statement inside the box is what you're trying to realize. You're trying to realize that statement. So then, if you take this and merge it with this, you glue the whole thing together to synthesize. You, know what I, you see what I'm doing? I'm merging. What am I doing? I use the word merge. Synthesis. I'm not analyzing now. I'm synthesizing. I put it together. And so when I put it together, now you come up with a generalized strategy. We're talking about generalized tactics, generalized grand tactics. And here's your strategy. You want to penetrate his moral, mental, physical beings with all the moral fiber, destroy his mental images, disrupt his operations, and overload his system. As well as subvert or seize with moral, mental, physical factions connected to those things that he depends upon. In order to destroy his internal harmony, improve paralysis, and collapse his whole ability, even to carry on. That's your strategy in the generalized sense, regardless of where you are. Now, obviously, you're going to have, what, many specific strategies, but they at least should subsume under them. Or like grand tactics, you have many grand tactics or operational things, maneuvers you're going to have, but they should be subsumed under that, because that, you're working, this is the human dimension. You're working as mind. Remember I said, brain doesn't wage wars, machines don't wage wars, people do when they use their minds. And if you get to their minds, you've got the people, you've got the machines, you've got the terrain. Okay? Let's look at them all together. Now, if you look at all these would you questions. Say this is one of the main <clears throat> objects of terrorists. Oh, goddamn right. I mean, that, a lot of this that I've got, a lot of this stuff that I showed you, well, this is some nation. Oh, I mean, let's, let's take it all together. Tactics, the grand tactics, the strategy, the strategic game. I answered your question. The tactics need the grand tactics to feed the strategy to feed the strategic game. And there's overlap. The whole thing's coherent, too. You see what I'm saying? It's all coherent. Now, answering your question. Where did I get a lot of this? I looked at the grills. I said, hey, these guys are really gifted at this stuff. I mean, it's in the Blitzkrieg, too, but you really see the grill operations and that kind of stuff. They're really gifted. I mean, they caused this enormous problem. And look at the Afghanis did to the Russians. Who, you know, we, the Russians, when they went to Afghanistan, you know, the idea wasn't to leave. They wanted to stay. They left with their tail between them. They can't, they, stay, they still can't believe it. In fact, they're calling it their Vietnam now. You see it on TV? They said, well, we're having our Vietnam. And they, they still, they're all screwed up. They, the veterans are all pissed off. They're all arguing with one another. They still can't figure out what happened. No, this is probably you know, I mean, have you looked at it? They're talking just like our guys. They had the same problem. They didn't realize they had to be in the village, not attack the village. I mean, in a different sense. But, you know, boy, you know, the difference between those, I mean, they didn't have It's not a Vietnam. I'm just trying to say there are connections. I mean, they, they didn't have any wars with the did. They weren't in the so they figured by just being hard nosed, they're going to make a take. Well, they had to leave. They had to depart the sea. And they're looking at themselves. They, they still can't figure out why they had to depart the sea. <laughs> because here they were the champion revolutionaries. But we were revolutionaries before those. Are now. When we fought the British, we did those kind of things. In the meantime, everybody's doing it to us. And also the Russians. Now. They got something along the way. Hmm? We forgot something along the way. So did they. See, they thought they were involved, but they're not. But you see what's going on here. It all plays together. It's all very coherent. Okay? It's just pouring all together. Now, let me give you an alternative for you. Once you read this chart. I mean, you can look at it that way. I just want you to look at it other ways, too, and think of your own ways. Remember, I said the important thing is to be able to look at these from many different viewpoints. So now let's just let's pull it apart and look at it another way. What you'll see is very similar. We want to look at that pyramid from a few different sides. Synthesize these things, lethal effort, maneuver, and moral. Lethal effort, this is the kind of maneuver, these are the kind of moral you're trying to work in. Pull it all together, here's your basic idea then. You can think of it that way. You say, well, hell, I can think of another way. It's great. They can write it down. Good. And the aim is very simple. 
But if you think about it, this is not much different than the previous chart. Mm -hmm. Got a little different focus. But you see the same kind of themes in there. It's just an alternate way of thinking about it. And maybe in some cases, this might be a better way of thinking about it than the other way, or maybe your own way. Okay, now what I want to do, now let's step all the way back to the beginning. Because we worked our way all the way through. Sun Tzu, Mongols, I mean, Napoleon, Mongols, Blitzkrieg, mm -hmm. Guerrilla War, Counter Blitz, Counter Guerrilla War, Categories of Conflict. There's something that keeps repeating itself over and over again. Theme begins to show up. This is it right here. Read that first box. Underlying insight. Know what I'm saying there. I underline the keyword penetrate. Unless one can penetrate, I'm sorry, more and physical being and sever those bonds or connections that permit the existence of an organic whole, as well as subverter sees those things that he depends upon, etc. We'll find it exceedingly difficult and not impossible to find that penetrate. Well, if you can't penetrate and do that, why should he throw the talent? He won't. And so even though Russians made a physical penetration to Afghanistan, they didn't penetrate the other stuff, therefore they didn't throw the towel in and said they had to get out, just like we did in Vietnam. You think back over everything we've talked about the last two nights and tonight. Work your way back from Sun Tzu, Mongols, Napoleon, Congress, Germany, World War One, World War Two, Blitzkrieg, Counter Blitz, Guerrilla, Counter Guerrilla. That's what's going on. Which leads to what I call the name of the game. When that penetrates, then that permits you to isolate him from his allies or isolate themselves from one another. In other words, you're generating as many non cooperative gravity. They don't have a base of support that nurtures, that keeps the operation going. It just withers away. Withers away. Now, if you're going to have principles of war, these are two good principles. Penetrate and isolate, two of them at least. You want to penetrate that guy, they're out of the book. You want to isolate those components, one from the other, and then subdue or overload those components so you can get him to do what you want him to do, not what he wants to do. That's part of it. I'll come back to it later on. <laughs> okay. Now, which raises an interesting question. We're going to step up to a higher level. How do we connect these notions to, or the theme for disintegration and collapse to the national goal? Remember, that doesn't even go theme for disintegration and collapse, that alternative view. How do we do that? So let's look at that. And these are the kind of things you should be interested in. One, we should support the national goal. <laughs> Two, we should pump up. Should we, we should set up such a pumps up. Our resolve, the way adversary resolve, in fact, the unsubmitted. And that's where we lost in Vietnam. We lost the Grand Strategic Club. We pumped up their resolve, drained away ours, and they attracted the uncommitted. We had to come home. We lost the Grand Strategic Club. So did Hitler. It's a good time. He pumped up the other adversary resolve, drained away. He didn't really drain away his, they held together pretty well. But he did. Caused because their operations caused the enemies to attract the uncommitted. We also lost the Grand Strategic Club. And you want to end conflict on favorable terms. And obviously, ensure that peace terms don't provide seeds for future conflict, or in the event they do, at least not unfavorably toward you, for you. So if you paste all that together, you come up with a basis for grand strategy. Mm. But here's the basis for it. You better have this basis, otherwise you're not even going to play that game. Sun Tzu had two thirds, but never said, know your enemy, know yourself. you got to know your enemy, you know yourself, and also those third parties out there. It's not just a two-corner stool, it's a three-corner stool. Is this the level above us as, as, as military people, though? You as a military person better understand that, particularly you get caught in the real operation. I understand it, but how... But the politician better understand this, otherwise you can get us in trouble if they start doing the wrong things, if that's your nature of your well, once we're committed, we're well beyond this, and this is out of our hands. Wait a minute. No, no, no. You get in a guerrilla war, like I said, if you can get inside the villages, instead of attacking the villages, in a sense, you're playing this kind of a game. Sorry, this is proactive. You can do this before the conflict starts. Of course, before, before and even before afterward, the but it gets tougher after. Your point is well taken. It's, it's harder. But it can still be done. It's got to be done very delicately. 
But you know, you can't think of running a couple hundred tanks in there and blowing away villages because all you're going to do is alienate. You know, you're pretty soon it's pretty soon, but they're, you're, they're against you. We should be doing this before the conflict starts. Precisely. You know what we should be doing? Right now. Right now. To answer your question, absolutely. Right now, we should be doing it. I'm waiting for the conflict to start. We have you want to get on top of it. Right. Get that leverage. I don't think you build up friends. I don't think you're not hosing on people. Except the guys are trying to be. Maybe, I was, getting, maybe I was getting too much down into the weeds. By the time they send me in, well, if you I don't have the man, opportunity going to uh, Granada prior and try to make friends, try to get into the village to that work could with happen. them. That, I mean, if you're sending that kind of an operation, you're already been given the order to do it. Well, you can't disobey the order. Very true. But then what that is, that's a screw up in their part because we get pushed into that position to do something. <laughs> now, we're, now we're attacking the village instead of trying to get inside the village. I mean, you can't say I'm not going to do it because they're going to court march me. But it's still a screw up. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. It's still a screw up. And we've got to recognize it. If we don't recognize it, we're going to continue to make more and more screw ups. That's all I'm trying to say. And so it's not only know your enemy, know yourself, but also the third parties out there and understand your culture and all that we're talking about. So then you can play this game. And like the gentleman back there, what's your name? If you're not prepared to play that game, you know what my recommendation is? Stay the hell out. Because you're only going to muck it up and embarrass yourself before your country and everybody else. Which was at your point the other night. You're just screwed up, that's all. And the people lose confidence in you, like right now, because we're having a hard time running a third world operation, because every time you try to think of something like that, where we're trying to help people out, Vietnam, right away they raise the flag. The very thing you're talking about, they raise the goddamn Vietnam flag, really. Then they all, everybody starts trembling, well, we can't do that. Even though you're right. Okay, so we paste all that together, now we invert again. Remember, I went from bottom up, tactics and grand tactics, and now we're going top down. Your national goal. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> the national grand strategy, game strategy, grand strategy, all these we said. So you don't have to read them all. The point I'm trying to bring out here, if you look at these, the upper two tend to be constructive in nature, yet they operate over a longer time frame. Whereas the bottom four, which is he was sort of alluding to, tend to be destructive in nature, but they operate over a shorter time frame. So the question is, how do you harmonize these two things that sort of have opposing tendencies? Short term versus long term, and constructive versus destructive. And you sort of have to, you know, that's the way the world is. You're going to have to face up. How do you, how do you, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? And so this little note here, this message under this inside here, is a way of thinking about it. I'll let you read it in a formal sense, and I'll, I'll deal even more simply after you read it. I'll let you read it first. saying here? Anybody? What am I really saying? What I'm saying is very simple. If you go in there and not only get a quick victory, but behave afterward, people are going to tend to be on your side. Why? Because here, if they spent money over a number of years building up their defense establishment, and the whole thing collapses away in no time, they're going to think they're a bunch of corrupt bastards. So you got that work for you. But if you go in there and come down heavy-handed, you lose it all. You lose it all. Think about it. Remember, if you, let's say our country got invaded, and here we spent years, billions of dollars of defense, and somebody came here and took us over very fast, you'd say those dirty bastards, they didn't even know how to do it. But then if the guy comes down hard, then you reunify him. In a sense, that's what happened with Hitler against uh, against Russia. Remember, they were welcomed in, but then Hitler came down harder than the Stalin. They said, well, we're going to have a dictator, we're going to have our own. So it's very delicate. You've got to be very careful.
Okay, now let's have a further elaboration. Let's build up to a higher level. Sort of a philosophy. Further left. Pull it apart and put it back together again in a different sense. Working up to a higher level. Let's read that. In other words, what we're talking about here is what I like to call a unifying vision or a unifying theme for all of us. You can think of tactics, you can think of grand tactics, or strategies, goals, but also you want to work on a big, huge, unifying theme. This they call a theme for vitality and growth. Remember, we had a theme for disintegration and collapse. Now we got a theme for we got a proposing theme for vitality and growth. Unifying vision, this kind of thing. Now the Marxists thought they had one there for a while, but since their system's been tested, it's not holding up. And that was a theme that the world was going to march to. Unifying vision. They're trying to show the flaws in the other system. If you develop that, you better be sure you have it kind of looked at pretty carefully. In other words, you're trying to really build a super organic hole. On the other hand, you got to be very careful. You make it too rigid, then you lose these things. Here are the ingredients you need to pursue that vision. Insight, initiative, adaptability, harmony. Those kind of ingredients. Now, too often, when people build a unifying vision, they lose this. In the U.S., we're the other way. We tend to have this and not this. They're sort of opposite. They're sort of in tension with one another. If you go one way, you tend to lose the other. If you go the other way, you tend to lose the other. So there might be some time in your life, this is more important, you might lose a little bit. Some other time you want to play this, this is less important. So you're always trying to work that balance. It's an endless game, always trying to work that balance. Now, there was one time where we sort of had the good balance. When was that? I mean, talking about a time of real crisis. World War II. Because we had Hitler out there, see? So we got everybody unified. We could use him as the base. He's the evil, and therefore we can still have these two things together. Okay. That, that, that's easy to um, understand because we were threatened, we were hit with Pearl Harbor and things like that, but when you take a look at Vietnam or even present situation... No, what you just said. No, wait, let's stop. I'm going to let you pick it up. What did you just say? Go back up what you just said. Very important what you just where we said. Were, where we were directly threatened? You were hit at Pearl Harbor? Yes. So what happened? We hit that. We use that as a basis to unify. In other words, these guys right. doing that. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why you got to be very careful of being heavy handed. So if you do something like that, you can unify your adversary. But I'm saying like. And it's particularly important on guerrilla wars. That's why I said, know what you just said. The Japanese unified us. Before that happened, we had America First units. We had the German American Bund. We had all that stuff. If you look back in history, I was a young kid at that time. I remember that. And as soon as they did that, the whole country unified, god damn it, if they're going to play that kind of game, we're going to kick them in the ass and win this thing. That's what our unified situation is not. Say again. In our society, what I've seen in history, unify us as a society, the way you're talking, is an attack on us. So we have to, what you're really saying is since we need a kick in the ass. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. Sure that doesn't give us that unifying That's right. Vietnam. That's not, tough. Not That's what I'm trying to tell you. Not but some way, if you, if you know how to play the moral and mental game and show people are really undermining you and you really are in that crisis and your people are clever enough, you can do that. Maybe not to the extent because of a Pearl Harbor, but it's sufficiently enough so you can play the game. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But if you don't know how to do that and the guy says, fuck them, we're going to bomb them back to Stone Ages, you lose it all. You lose it all. Not the same. In the market economy, you can almost see it. But what happened in the start, you heard you go. And then... The Iranian airliner. I've felt many times myself. We had shot down that airline just, just five years ago, seven years ago. It, I think that the whole reaction of the country and the media was completely different. And yet, so when that happened, basically the attitude of the, of the American. Why did we get away with it? I say, I think because of relating, relating it to the start, a short time earlier. Plus, Not only that, everything that's happened. By the way, the Iranians were behaving and sinking right. those ships and shelling those ships. That just horned right. everybody off. And so they, 
The people said, okay, we shouldn't have done it. The American people thought we shouldn't have done it, right. but it was a goof and it wasn't intentional. Where if you were saying it done in peacetime, they want to see generals fired and politicians fired. You're right. shooting at America. That's right. But see, the circumstance was a different environment. In other words, it wasn't really morally justified what we did, but it was recognized as a goof. There wasn't an intent to do it. They could get away with it. That's my point. That's right. We didn't want to do it. It's obvious the guy that did that didn't want to do that. It was a goof. Just like the Iraqi guy he pumped it, we at least we think he pumped one into the star. I mean, we didn't like it. But we were supporting, you know. I mean, so the guy goofed, he got, you know, he probably looked at the scope. God, I've got a big goddamn Iranian target out there, let me launch one. Two of me. But I think it's the same situation that happened. Remember, he pumped two missiles into the star. In the 70s, even though even, even it was a goof. I don't think it would have been accepted by the American people. I think we would still be beating up right over the cost of the time. But because of circumstances. See, that sets the moral climate. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But in that case, we weren't attacking Japan or Germany and that when they made, when they made attack in Pearl Harbor. They just unified the nation. A lot of national resolve in those hostages were taken by Yeah, the Iranians helped us out there, too. That's right. I think, unless you have something like that, preserving some of our Central American homes. Yeah, but let me show you. That's why I want to hear my strategy brief. I address a lot of those things more specific and very, in a very uh, way. I show you how those, you set, use those mismatches to use it to your advantage. There's mismatches there, and how you use those, you deliver the situation. But it also demands a certain way you have to behave. If you don't behave right, you can lose it all. Do you agree that it's got to be in spite of the politicians doing to each other? Well, the politicians can they can undermine the whole thing if they do some dumb things. So they have to be careful, and people have to say, listen, Tiger, that doesn't help us. Why is Jim, oh, why is Jim right in trouble right now? I think he's in trouble because they went after power. Well, that's one reason. That's part of it. I'm sure that's it. But why are these, I told you the other night, why are these guys in trouble? Mm -hmm. You know, what happens, if, See, right now, we've got a huge national debt. I mean, it's going into what do you call it, the deficit finance. we got our trade balance is going to hell. We're paying these huge things. Our standard of living is going to hell for a lot of people. Maybe in the military, you're better off, and some of the guys, the rich people are better off. There's a lot of people out there who are, are not doing well. They're on fixed incomes, and everything's sliding away from them. They're even getting less income. I mean, I'm out there. I'm watching. I'm not in the Washington area inside the Beltway, Christ, smoking a cigar, having a nice good glass of wine, and living a good life. Or, you know, a Washington Post reporter does all his goddamn work out of the uh, press room up there, and Christ, he's got a nice, he's got a nice uh, word processor and all that, and Christ, the editor kisses ass in order to get a good story and give him a good salary. And they do all the work inside the goddamn beltway. They're not sensitive to what's going on. There's people who are horned off. Now, 51% pay rate, it outraged the whole, I was down in Florida, and that, they were sore. They would have strangled some of the guys that could have got a hold of. Why do you think the Congress gave it up? They really wanted pay rates. They knew they were in trouble if they went for it. <laughs> And you know what it got? You know what they said down there? They said, when they start delivering the goods, getting rid of the debt, and doing what they're supposed to, then we can talk about pay raises. In fact, you know what it said? They said, maybe we ought to give a 51% pay cut. We'll give them the money based upon what they do. They haven't been doing anything except grabbing money for themselves. And if the goddamn job is such a poverty job, why is everybody fighting to retain their seat? Remember the 99% ran, free ran. And if it's such a goddamn, but why are they fighting to retain that seat in Congress? Couldn't be too bad. Or at least they like being poor. I mean, you should have seen, I saw the talks there. There people said they were out. It was terrible. They were out. Just, boy, they were really sore. And then you got these idiots in the post, David Broad and rest of them. Well, they deserved it. And what he get, $150,000 or $200,000 a year? He doesn't know what the hell's going on out there. He's comfortable inside the Beltway. I'm just picking on the post because they're inside the Beltway. They're not the only ones. See, that's, we're getting down some very fundamental things. And that's why they're mad at Jim Wright. If they were picking the pockets and all that, yet the other people were doing very well, they say, oh, well, that goes on. But not only are they playing that game, in the meantime, they're hosing others, the other people are getting screwed in the process. They say, oh, no, then it's too much. Politicians sort of have an innate gorilla ability to flow like water themselves. Well, they sure did flow in that one, didn't they? And they I forgot the pay rates. And <laughs> on the national 
sentiment, uh, the American people adopt an, an attitude, the politicians immediately shift. I think they thought they could get get that 51%. The American people just sit there and they might do a little drum and get away with it. Well, it blew up in their face. They didn't do just a little drum. They raised a fuss. You heard about the letters. You go for it. We're going to throw you out. That's the constituents. You go for that and you vote for it. We're throwing you out. You're not, you're not going to be reelected, we guarantee. Another thing they were and one guy said, holy Christ, I want to be reelected. He forgot that pay raise. Another, another source of resentment is the back door approach to accept this. They know Which is a filthy them. approach. Right. So they didn't have to take I any don't vote and it happens. Yeah, they would, don't have to vote. In other words, they didn't even take responsibility for it. They couldn't even put it up front. Sure. They tried to do it under the table, so to speak. Not only did they want to get 51%, they knew they wouldn't get it if they had it up front, so therefore they tried to sneak it in under the table. 